Welcome to When Football Began Again, the podcast that takes a nostalgic look at the Premier League era. Hello and welcome to episode three of When Football Began Again. I am your host, Carl Jones, and I have another fantastic episode in store for you today. Thank you so much for finding us for your slice of Premier League nostalgia. In today's show, we will be taking a deep dive into Swindon Town's Premier League history. It's the first of a new feature we'll be running the top 50 all-time Premier League table. Someone has to kick us off. It is Swindon Town in 50th place. I've got a great chat with Joe Ross-Williams, the comedian, and Rich Pullen, the podcaster, Swindon Town podcaster, who are both joining me for a really fascinating chat, a deep dive into what that season means to fans today, to to the fans who lived through it. They were both children during this season in 1993-94. And of course, what's happened to Swindon since and, and how they got to the Premier League. We're also going to have a go at picking the Premier League era's greatest Algerian player. Uh, there is one standout candidate, admittedly. However, listen to the lads make a case perhaps for a wild card entry. We will be putting that out on Twitter as well for you to get involved and have your say. And there's a return for Play Your Apps Right in this episode. Uh, it got a really, really good response in the first episode. I've shortened it down a little bit. It's an epic game between Joe and Rich, as you will find out. Listen to the end of the show for that and play along as well. It's, it's uh, a lot of fun. So without further ado, let's let the lads introduce themselves. Let's get stuck into this episode. Swindon Town, 50th in the all-time Premier League table. Let's find out a little bit more about their Premier League story. Joining me today to discuss Swindon Town's season in the sun is host of Swindon podcast, The Loathe Strangers, Rich Pullen. Hi, Rich. How are you doing? Hello, yeah, thank you for asking me to be on. It I kind of feels like for a fledgling podcast about the Premier League to start with Swindon Town is is a you know, it's brave, but we're happy to be here. <laughs> and also joining me is comedian and Swindon Town fan Joe Ross Williams. How are you doing, Joe? I'm very well. I thought you were gonna introduce me as a surrogate host or or stand in or some other. When when Rich is 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 away, I I help out on your pod as well, don't I? You do a bloody good job, Joe. Thank you. Thank you. (laughs) I feel like I feel like this is your annual appraisal. This is brilliant. So uh, welcome to the show. Thank you both for joining me. I mean, let's start with you, Rich. For the uninitiated, where does that name, The Loathe Strangers, come from? And also tell me a bit about your history with Swindon. When did you start going? Yeah. So in terms of the podcasts, I hate podcasts that are like Robin's Review or, you know, (laughs) nickname with something that has the same letter following it. So I called it The Load Strangers, which comes from Nick Hornby's book, Fever Pitch. There's a chapter called Don Rogers, which is about the 1969 League Cup final between Arsenal and Swindon. Nick Hornby is obviously an Arsenal fan who was at that game as a young lad. And um, when Swindon score... He notices the uh, the glee and silly accents of Swindon fans surrounding him, and he he observes that he had never loathed strangers like he had loathed them in that moment, and therefore we are the low strangers. Uh, pretentious maybe, but better than Robin's review. Yeah, my my first game. I'm closing in on the 32nd anniversary of my first game, which was in November 1990. Um, it was a 2-1 loss against Port Vale. And the first goal I ever saw Swindon score was an own goal by Darren Beckford. So pure poetry. And I've always been a non-prolific uh, attendee of Swindon games over the years due to various reasons. I'm not a Swindonian. Um, but it's only made the love stronger, I think, being absent. But now I'm more of a regular and it's it's great. But... Yeah, uh, we, we've seen our fair share, maybe too much over the years, but at least we've got this one year in the Premier League. Well, we're going to reflect on that very shortly. Joe, same question for you, really. How how long have you been going to Swindon and sort of, you know, how, how, how long have they been enhancing your life? Well, this is this is interesting to talk about the Premier League season because um, I'm not 
I'm not originally from Swindon Way. I grew up in Newquay, so not really a lot of football going on. Maybe kids who are really into football might go to Argyle a couple of times a year. Um, but yeah, a bit of a, a bit of a desert in terms of football. None of my family are from Swindon, but my dad was in the RAF. So he got stationed at RAF Rawton and was living in Swindon with my now stepmom. So just from that huddle season, this was when his post had started. It started with the curiosity. And then with the promotion and seeing them, this coincided with, you know, being a you know irresponsible uh, 11-year-old and having a TV in my room and, you know, spending all night watching rubbish and fantasy football league and match of the day. So then it became the the fascination with with Swindon. Uh, and then a few years later when I'd moved there, it was only about 96 I got to see the game, but I was already, you know, a keen, a keen follow on that. I used to like Liverpool as a smaller kid. So you had a team that was all in red. They had a weird badge. Dad lived there. This was something to think, hmm, this is... This is ticking a lot of boxes. And were you, were you a ball boy, Joe, as well? Is that right? Yeah, I had a little stint in the, uh, what was it, 97, 98 season. Mm. They used to, I don't know if they still do it like this, but they used to do um, with the, like the, the Young Supporters Club, the Junior Robins, there was an opportunity where if you're a bit older, you could be um, a ball boy. Bonfire night against QPR and a, a firework going off above me in the Arkles. Which I've long thought it's only when in the prep for doing this pod, I was thinking, you know, maybe somebody had brought one in, but it could well have been from, you know, the terraces opposite. Swindon is quite close to houses and it's still very much like in the town centre. So perhaps, perhaps I've maligned QPR fans wrongly uh, for <laughs> that one. And the other, the other one that really sticks out was um, doing the last game of the season against the last home game against Sunderland. Ooh. And Rich, remember that we practically gave the ground to them and Peter Reed has. Cock a hoop. Bobby Saxton kept coming through. So there was like a little weight room. Um, and I mean, really just like a bench and a couple of dumbbells uh, on the floor. And every time he'd come through, he'd pick up a ball and boing it off my head. Uh, <laughs> not in a in a super aggressive way, but they were very gleeful. I think they might have even given them the house mic at the end for <laughs> Peter Reed to rally the troops. And then, of course, they had that playoff with Charlton, so it didn't work out. As you've already touched upon, Rich, there's no getting away from it. It is our first episode dedicated to the all-time Premier League. In 50th place, it is Swindon Town. Football didn't begin in 1992. However, that doesn't make things much better, as this is also Swindon's only season in the top flight in their history, too. They are 63rd out of 65, uh, above Leighton Orient and Glossop North End in that table. So, you know, there's a six-pointer coming up there. So we are going to dig deeper shortly. But between the two of you, how... Is the 93-94 season remembered among the fan base? Let's start with you, Rich. Not as much as it should be, I will say. So our moment under the sun or moment in the sun was the 1969 League Cup final that I mentioned before. And it, it should be talked about a lot more. But I think because of how many games we lost, how many goals we conceded, I don't think those who were born after 93, 94 or weren't following the club at that time just don't see it in the same way. I remember reading a Swindon fan who who doesn't remember that era refer to it as one of our biggest embarrassments. And that was never the case really at the time. And I don't see it as that anyway. I mean, Swindon Town, the size of the club historically being there is is quite a remarkable feat and we had such a great 10 years where we went through so many major names in management like Midlou Makari, Ozzy Ardiles and then and then Glenn Hoddle who took us up and it and if you if you experience any of that it's hard not to look back fondly on it but I just don't think we as a collective really recognize it as much as it should be and you know it comes in the program every 15th 20th 25th 30th anniversary they sort of follow it through the season but I don't know if Joe agrees with that but I, I just don't think we, we discuss it as much it's kind of it's it's fading into uh, obscurity in terms of we're not relevant to modern Premier League fans and to Swindon Town fans of recent years all they know is League One and League Two what do you what do you think Joe I think there's a lot of a lot of truth in that. That yes, it does seem like certainly amongst the fan base, like if you were there, you were there, and if not, that you don't know. Certainly, I've found 
particularly going to university or things like that, you say that you support Swindon, which is not always, you know, the biggest conversation starter going, people would people would remember that that Premier League season. Um, I remember speaking to you probably know Suze Kempner doing um BT Sport idents last year and she did one as you know, Liza Minnelli with the Swindon Town obsession and having a love affair with Don Rogers, which is very niche stuff. But that all came from the research of remembering doing the the Merlin book and seeing the the funny badge and there's little things like that and Yanaga Fjortoft and things like that that still stick in people's mind. I think you got two generations of if you mention Swindon to people, they either remember that or more recently they'll remember, you know, Decanio being crazy. And those are the two things that the wider football community know of Swindon. They're the go-tos. Well, let's start in 92-93. So the Premier League is a shiny new object at the Summit of English Football. The scramble is on in the newly rebranded First Division to get there. In an unlikely twist, the documentary crew follow Swindon for the season and capture their fifth place finish before beating Leicester 4-3 at Wembley to join West Ham and Newcastle in promotion to the second season of the Premier League. Rich, that the That's Football documentary, and it wasn't actually broadcast until a year, a year later when Swindon had actually been relegated as well. At, there's so many documentaries about football teams now, but this is, it's very 90s, isn't it? Do you remember watching that when it went out? Yeah, I think I have vague memories of watching it. Of course, I've seen it a couple of times in more recent years. Um, I think in terms of pure 1990s football documentaries go, it's actually not that bad. Um, we don't embarrass ourselves that much, that's for sure, like, like you get elsewhere. I think the premise was originally about mental health or something like that, wasn't it? It wasn't, it wasn't supposed to be just your generic season follow, but because of Swindon's form, it just turned that way. It was, it's really interesting. And there's some really good sort of um, interviews with some of the players in there. Um, people like Martin Ling, who probably was taking it seriously for mental health, you know, someone who would later um be on the record with his suffering in that respect and then it just turned into this sort of season where yeah it just that that does that really does turn into being in Kevin Morris's physiotherapy room with Steve White in his pants moaning about players not being injured at the moment because we're winning um which is everything you want to see isn't it and also chairman Ray Hardman at the time gets a lot of stick from fans for not investing in the squad. Ironically, when you reach the Premier League, he's then accused of spending a bit too lavishly and leaving the club in financial peril. Um, so Swindon. It's like that yeah. you know, they do one thing, we're not happy, they 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 change their minds and we're like, well, what did you change your mind for? Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, that interview with David Kerslake in the documentary where he clearly looks annoyed that he's got to go to Leeds, who had just won the league, you know, they just won the old first division essentially the equivalent of Swindon selling a player to Manchester City. And he looks absolutely devastated with it, which which says a lot. And the fact that that, that part of the documentary is pretty much exclusively about selling who was the right best right back outside the top flight at the time. He was in the teams of the year every year for about three or four seasons but yeah it, it we this is this is that's so swindon town you know we're not ever a million miles away from peril even when the go going is at its absolute best the bubble bursts and when it bursts it bursts hard and that's that that sort of mentality still sticks with swindon that you know we, we're never happy in many ways but <laughs> we're, we're football fans and we're just worried that things go wrong very very quickly which in fairness to those fans moaning it did. You say it, those those moments when things are at their absolute best, because obviously Glenn Hoddle is player manager, he's already been linked with Chelsea yeah. before the playoff final is is played. I think there's there's banners like at the promotion parade asking him to stay, isn't there? And then and then Gorman takes over, who does appear to be the main man in the dressing room during that during that documentary. Um what, what, Joe, what is Hoddle's legacy at the county ground? How is he remembered? Uh, it's interesting, like like Rich was saying about the Premier League season. Anyway, it does seem to be like a generational thing. It does seem that you know whenever he comes up or if he comes back, um, and I know there was plenty of you know media controversies that he had with you know his religious remarks and his faith healer and all that kind of stuff. But in terms of the Swindon fan base, he still he still is very much on a on a pedestal. He seems quite untainted by um, everything else that has 
has gone before and he's always seemed to come back to a hero's welcome. Rich will know more recently because I've, I've seen that's football and there's a famous clip of him circulating around of you know, dishing out the instructions on the training yard. Is it with, I have an argument with Craig Maskell or someone like that? Oh, it's, but it's, it's Mickey Hazard. Mickey Hazard. Mickey Hazard. The that's the one, yes. But this idea that Glenn Hoddle's talent and, you know, his, his legendary skill, he just seemingly can't compute that other people can't <laughs> read yeah. or do what he does it's very funny to watch but the idea that other people just can't suddenly switch it on and do it there's two glenn hoddles i think to swindon fans of of this generation there's glenn hoddle the player and glenn hoddle the manager and glenn hoddle the player is the best player that anyone if you saw him play for swindon he's one of the best players you ever saw because he was just unbelievable in that sweeper role but in terms of ditching us and again so typically Swindon that we get to the promised land finally having almost got there three years before too to 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 lose him so soon after and the conversation from the moment the game finished being you stay in or you're going that's just that's just typical Swindon and that part of the documentary where they're walking up and down um the offices you know one minute Glenn Hoddle goes then then John Gorman um goes into the room it's pure theater it's it's fascinating and it's amazing that they got a camera in there because that would not happen now no i think there was talks of hoddle taking gorman with him obviously would bring him to the uh, the england job a few years later gorman takes over and uh in terms of squad changes coming into that season so colin coldwood who'd captain the robins all the way from the old fourth to the top flight does leave for spurs for a fee of 1.25 million uh he too be followed by glenn hoddle's old teammate at uh, vicky hazard early on in the season and david mitchell who went to millwall in terms of mm-hmm. incomings uh norwegian international jan agafjortov joins from rapid vienna adrian whitbread arrives from Leighton orient plus luke I hope from Motherwell. So it's quite a different story compared to these days. Obviously, we see Nottingham Forest signing two two teams with. Uh, um, Rich, how big a signing was Fjortoft? Had had you heard of him before he joined? How quickly did he become a fan's favourite? I think it, it was it, it was an early sign of wow, we're in the top flight now. We're signing Norwegian internationals. This is it, guys. And I think my memory and you have to forgive me, I was very young, but my initial memory and of people talking about it was the fact that he was in the Norway starting eleven when they beat England about a month before. They beat us 2-0 in Norway, and Fjortov played the first hour of that and was on the pitch when the, when the goals went in. And the assumption was that, of course, he was going to just be an instant superstar. It was It's a great name, Jan Aga Fjortov. It's got all the dots and the lines, everything that you need um, from an overseas footballer. And there's no getting past the fact that he was an absolute disaster for the first <laughs> half of the season. And he was his, his place at the World Cup in 94 was in, in huge jeopardy. And he just could not score. Loads of effort. The more he tried, the, 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 the less he would get <laughs> joy from. And he was on the brink of going back to Norway on loan to maintain his spot in the, in the USA 94 squad. And then he scored in an FA Cup game, and then in, in any turn back. And then he became the glory that is Jan Fjortoft, the flying Norwegian um, with his airplane celebration. And we we made a profit on him a year later when we were going down again. So he was, he was great. And he is very much the symbol of that era. Um, loads of fun, lots of goals, ultimately... Fail, fail, which, <laughs> which is very much 93 to 95 for Swindon. Fjortov did an interview with The Guardian. He said that on Christmas Eve 1993 was the lowest point of his career. He played <clears throat> for Swindon Reserves against Wickham Wanderers. It was cold and windy. I was freezing to death. I was the worst player on the pitch. I remember I came home, opened the door and said dramatically to my wife, have a look at me now because no one can ever get lower in their football career than I am now. <laughs> uh, and as you, as you say, Rich, he negotiated his own loan spell to Lillestrom. He agreed it with them uh, but then came the goal against Ipswich in the cup and even though Swindon lost he said the next morning I went into Swindon town centre to get something for my wife I saw posters for the local paper with the headline please don't go Jan it was all over the place and that was an unbelievable moment 
this this I absolutely adore this because then he does score against Spurs. He he cancelled his loan. He became convinced he would score in that game, which was Swindon's twenty seventh league game at that time. He said after twenty minutes, Eric Torsvet, who was my roommate with the national team, got injured, and as he was being carried off, I went up to him and screamed, "Fucking coward!" Because I somehow knew I was going to score my first goal in the Premier League. I thought he wasn't daring enough to stay on. I mean. Joe, he's delightfully bonkers, isn't he? That he thought his own international teammate uh, feigned injury just to avoid conceding to him. Oh yeah, of course. And if you if you if you happen to look on his uh, social media these days, and his his role as a, a sports broadcaster now, he still has that kind of craziness to him, which I always find infectious. He does a lovely ident on the uh, on the pod, and every time it comes, and it gives me a gives me a great day. But I think that's probably what gives him skill as a sports broadcaster is to to have gone through those sort of highs and lows, the zeniths and apexes, and when you see him, you know, actually get. A, a sit down with a, a Guardiola or someone like that. He does, he does seem to approach it more on the level rather than enthusiastic fan. So, all, all power to him. He still talks about Swindon. That's the best thing about Jan Fjortov in modern times. You know, Glenn Hoddle will only talk about Swindon if he's absolutely forced to. Even his autobiography that came out recently, the only part of his career that doesn't have a picture in the middle is his Swindon career, you know. It's, <laughs> you know, and he does obviously talk about Swindon and um, in, in the book, but you just want him to just mention it sometimes, and he never does. But yeah, and he won't hesitate to bring up an anniversary on social media about his time at town. He was great, and he... It was tough for him because we had such a good strike partnership the year before with Maskell and Mitchell. And Maskell just wasn't Premier League. And Dave Mitchell actually didn't go directly to Millwall. He went buggered off to Turkey for about five minutes for about four and sixpence. <laughs> and then rocked up in the championship by autumn with, with, like you said, Millwall. And that was so annoying. The exodus that we had going into the Premier League was, was, a, was a huge blow. The first half of the season kicks off. Gorman attempting to replicate the sweeper system, uh, but with a fairly notable Glenn Hoddle-shaped hole in his team. Uh, the season does kick off with four defeats, including a last-minute 1-0 defeat at home to Oldham. It's that Ugh. famous sort of Gorman on his on his knees. Yep. Uh, the, the first win does come uh, at home to QPR in November, um, the 16th game. They didn't do it the easy way, going to, down to 10 men, with Luke Nyholt getting sent off for two quick yellows in the 18th minute. Keith Scott's close-range strike seals the points. And then there's a huge point at Anfield as well in December in a 2-2 draw where they lead twice before a 2-1 home win against Southampton to bring Christmas cheer, keep the side in touch with the sides above. So by the turn of the year, the Robins are bottom with 15 points from 23 games, but still only five points behind Manchester City, who were five places above them. I mean, Joe, it's obviously a rough start to life in the top flight, but they're never out of touch. They're never cut adrift, are they? They're always kind of within touching distance of that, of that pack. It was interesting, you know, looking to prep for this and looking at like the current table and think of just how long it was waiting for that first win in November because there was a couple of one ones here and there and pegging people back to me. I had to draw with Everton and Ipswich and just just feel like it's coming, it's coming here. And even though it's just the marginal win, that's that's one of the things of you know we talked about you know whether legacy is wider wider forgotten with the wider fan base, but. Again, the people who were there and were following the um, Premier League era will still point to that first win as being a, a pivotal moment as to that was where we could all crack on from. And I remember, like I said, following from a distance and watching on Match of the Day and just sort of trying to will something to happen because I'd you know, grown an affection for this this team and then even to just squeak a win there and Almost just bubbling under, but it's still being in reach, just feeling like, you know, a couple more wins string together and, you know, we could stay up, but ultimately it wasn't to be. You've you yeah. also got to remember that 10 years before these games, Swindon are going away to Chester and there's a, there's the 900 fans at the game. So we're having a great time. We're, we're, we're seeing all these teams. Some of these teams that you'll see on, on the fixture list may not be Premier League May stays now, but going away to QPIs is huge for, for Swindon. And then the big hitters like Manchester United, Liverpool were doo doo at that stage. You know, that going to Anfield and getting a point was a disappointment, um, even though they absolutely spanked us uh, on Sky at the start of the season. But um, it. it that's the thing that people forget when they're just looking at the black and white of scores. Mm. They're forgetting Swindon's journey from the 10 years from that, that preceded this season. And what we are experiencing is, is, is unbelievable. And 
yeah, 10 years from Division 4 to the Premier League mm. was, was a huge achievement. And Swindon fans knew that at the time, that they were just going to enjoy it. We took it for granted, absolutely. You know, 10-year-old me thought we would bounce straight back. But those games, I remember that Oldham loss in the last minute. I was behind the goal when Gunnar Halle crossed it in. And I remember minutes before telling my dad that we were going to go and see a nil-nil. And my dad went, oh, not over yet. And, <laughs> and the rest was history in that respect. But I was right in front of Gunnar Halle as he, as he crossed that ball in, you know, yards away. And I'll never forget it, but... There was never this, you know, nowadays with the heightened sense of like podcasting and content, you know, everything's a drama every week and everything's a high and everything's a low. We were going with the flow back in 93, 94 and just enjoying it. And hell, they gave plenty of entertainment. Sure, because he did a hell of a lot of goals, but we, we were having we were having good fun. I, well, I was anyway. Absolutely. And and after Christmas, the results do pick up a little bit after Christmas as well. There's back-to-back -back wins against Spurs with that first Fjortoff goal we've already touched upon. A fortnight later against Coventry, where he gets a hat-trick, leaving Swindon once again just a couple of points away from the safety line in early February. Have you got memories of that, Rich? Well, the, the, the famous one, is, is that Coventry away? Well, we beat them at home, didn't we, with Fjortoff scored a hat-trick. Mm -hmm. But Coventry away is funny because Richard Keyes was humiliated on Sky because... There was a game that was called off, so they streamed Swindon at Coventry, and Coventry were one nil up, and they lost the feed it just going into injury time. And Richard Keys is telling the pundits, oh, "Swindon are rubbish, aren't they?" So you know he's he's using that usual <laughs> Keys sort of language, and then at one point he's got a report that Andy Much has scored in the last minute, and oh, it's 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 online, it's brilliant. Um, <laughs> And anything where Richard Keyes gets his comeuppance, it seems to be enjoyable, doesn't it? So yeah, that does leave Swindon just a couple of points away from the safety line. Uh, despite Fjortos' goals in the weeks ahead, it would be their final win for almost three months. There's an attempt to bring in more experience during this period. Andy Mutz, Terry Fenwick, Frank McAvenny and Laurie Sanchez all join but it won't be enough. Points at Highbury, Portman Road, and at home to Norwich, West Ham, and famously eventual champions of Manchester United, were interspersed with heavy defeats at Villa, and infamously that 7-1 drubbing at the hands of Newcastle. So, Rich, obviously that is a day best forgotten, but as you say, I mean, you, Swindon at this time are enjoying themselves and enjoying being in the Premier League. How do you kind of remember that game? And of course, Swindon had come up with Newcastle, hadn't they? Yeah, on my 10th birthday, we, we played oh. at the county grounds and drew 2-2, two -two, went 2-0 down and scored two goals in a minute. It was brilliant. Andy Much doing a somersault and that somersault footage would be on grandstand at the opening, um, in the opening credits for the rest of the season, which is probably our biggest claim to fame by the 100 goals conceded. They had Sir John Hall money. We didn't. They, they had Andy Cole, Rule Fox... Scott Sellers on the wing and, and players like that. We we brought someone on in that game who we got from the Guernsey Football League, you know. So it it it's not really comparable what we achieved and what we did against them because we beat them mm. at home the season before and drew at St James's Park. I don't think any Swindon fan really goes here, but we lost. We lost by a lot of that season. Fives and sixes weren't weren't uncommon. So I don't think. I don't think it's it's too much of a big deal for us. But you did miss Brian Killer Kill Klein in that list. So Andy Much came in quite early into the season. I think Andy Much was our compromise with Wolves because we wanted Steve Ball. But obviously Steve Ball doesn't leave Wolves. But so we said, well, can we have his mate instead? And they went, yeah, all right then. And so we had Andy Much, who was all right. You know, he wasn't Premier League standard. And then all the players that you that you've mentioned. Terry Fennick is probably probably the one that played the most. Um, but he is he is on the downward you know trajectory of his career. Frank McAvenny. <laughs> Frank <laughs> McAvenny was um yeah, yeah, he wasn't great. Laurie Sanchez, I think, takes retrospective glee in the fact that he put the nail in Swindon's coffin. When I spoke to him, he was far more complimentary about reading his former club in Oxford than he was talking about Swindon. And Kilcline came in and was Brian Kilcline. Anyone knows Brian Kilcline, you know, you know what you're gonna get. And that's what that's what he did. But again, he's aging. Farcical transfer business, to be fair. They weren't building for the future, they were building for the present. And I'm not entirely sure there was any logic in, in signing these players. They needed to build for the championship or division one as it was then, the first division. And instead they were just 
bit of jobs for the boys, some big names to make us go, oh, Terry Fennick plays for us now. He was, he was, you know, he was beaten by Diego Maradona in one of those goals. You know, it was, <laughs> it, it, it was terrible transfer policy. Um, that's the one, one of the big mistakes they made that year. The other one was probably appointing John Gorman in the first place. Um, they, they went with their hearts instead of their heads on that front. But yeah, the veterans, they added nothing. And then the final nail does come at home to Wimbledon on April 23rd, 1994. Swindon, already needing snookers with four games to go, were, were finally relegated. They do complete an unlikely double against QPR with a 3-1 victory in the penultimate game of the season. A 5-0 home defeat to Leeds on the final day in front of almost 18,000 fans was rounded off, though, when Chris Fairclough's last-minute goal became the 100th conceded in a season, as you mentioned, Rich. It is a Premier League record, unfortunately, that does still stand to this day. We've covered it and touched upon it a little bit so far in terms of the legacy of that solitary season in the top flight joe what how do you reflect back on it do, will swindon ever get back there do you even want them to do you dream of seeing swindon back in the premier league one day well you know i'm always in the sense when i hear like phone-ins of people like um you had it in the past on things like 606 with stoke fans i think i've been on to rich about this before their teams are not playing attractive football and they're saying, I'd rather be in the championship if we could play well. Nonsense. Of course, we'd always want the Swindon to be, um, you know, in the Premier League. And for me, like looking back on the legacy of that is not just that, you know, there was the one season in the relegation. It's that, you know, quickly slipped down into the trapdoor going down into what's now League One, the old Div 2, which is a, a shocking state of affairs in McMahon's first uh, reign of that legacy of the fans, uh, you know, who is there, like we say, if it's remembered, you know, it's remembered very fondly. And people who have seen that era very much think that we should be there. Swindon as a town is very, you know, light industrial, very commercial. So when I see these places that I would hope that we'd stay at the county ground forever, but you see these people have got 30,000 bowls and a just can't help but think that Swindon is that kind of town that would have a £30,000 bowl on a retail park with a McDonald's and all that kind of thing. So though there's the you know, the legacy from the fans, the legacy that we have since then is more of slightly unscrupulous ownership, snake oil salesmen, because the potential is there. You've got a town that's you know, practically as big as a, a city. And while the fans see it, the, the potentially interested have seen a a financial opportunity that's never really come to fruition. We must have had new stadium plans drawn up three, four times, new training grounds. And this is this is still a legacy that continues now. If we think about you know having a manager potentially tapped off in the playoffs and then just going for the number two as as the option at the end of it, that's what we're living through now. That's what we're having live out now. So things don't tend to change much, just pinging around the the division. We'd got into a nice rhythm not so long ago of where you'd go down to uh, League Two, you'd employ some sort of Premier League name who's got a bit of a wild reputation, go back into League One, get to nearly get into the playoffs, lose all your players, and then tumble back down again. But slightly changed from that. I think the town has the potential to have that. But now you're seeing where you know, the championship is so heavy of teams who have made those investments that Swindon have missed out on of getting the you know the new stadium new facilities all of that the even lower championship to league one is always becoming an extension of that as well so they're much more it's much more difficult prospect then and i think rich will probably agree that when i first started watching swindon they've got back out of the you know the old div two what would have been league one to division one championship level people were quite quite pessimistic and quite down on watching championship level football as it would have been at the time and looking back now like Joni Mitchell you don't know what you've got till it's gone mm, yeah I mean we were getting 5,000 in the championship nearer to the end of our uh, last spell there at the well, 2000s we got relegated um, Swindon will probably benefit eventually <laughs> geographically because we're on that M4 you've got Reading that has investment and they got to their promised land and had a good decade. You've got Bristol City on the other side that's had loads of investment by a local person and why they've not made to the Premier League yet, I have no idea. But, you know, as much as they will probably disagree, historically, they're no great shakes. And then you've got Oxford that get regular investment. And then here's Swindon in the middle of all this. And we seemingly cannot attract 
that that major major investment which is what will result as we got to the premier league some fans will say because of swindle because of you know our financial irregularities but we got up in 92 93 because Glenn Hoddle was just a sensational footballer and a and a great football manager you know he was he was fantastic and now I don't think you can do that without a sizable budget so if Swindon ever do return and I want us to go to the Premier League I, I don't I, I'm exactly with Joe I don't like it when people go no I won't go if we go to the Premier League of course you will be front row centre <laughs> um, and and rightly so I think the Championship is is the real dream for us not as the that's as far as we can go but just to to shake the monotony of the League Two and League One clubs that we play, that that would be the dream. But now the way football is going is the top ten of League One is just is Championship clubs that have got themselves in a silly situation. So it, it's getting harder and harder. So just out so get out of League Two in a positive way would be would be the dream. But the the fact that we got to the Premier League with the way the club was ran is is is, is it would be a miracle now, but was much more common. As you'll talk to future guests on this podcast um, with similar stories. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And, and you've both really summarised that really nicely in terms of, I guess, where Swindon have been in that last 30 years and, and kind of up, up and down and been, been obviously been in all four divisions. I did have a look to kind of see where maybe Swindon's average league position would be over those 30 years. Do you, do you want to kind of take a guess? Where might oh, Swindon we've, be? We've got to be mid-table League One. I would yeah, say about 14th in League One. I'll say you, you, you're very, very close. It's 11th in League One. So actually, yeah. maybe that's kind of like par for maybe the last 30 years. And actually, you know, oh, our, our natural habitat is is the third tier. That's that's where we are historically. And my generation will say, well, what about the championship? But that was just a lovely decade. Mm-hmm. Division Three South is where we emerged into the football league, and League One is where we should be for the club of our size and with aspirations of going higher. But yeah, we are gloriously mid-table League One. Quite a nomadic uh, nomadic chap. And I, I lived in Leicester for a good while and now I'm living in, in Wickham. And you know, all my time in Leicester, I've been thinking about, you know, when we get to the championship, we'll go to a game. And yes, we did get to go to that game, but that was when they came down to League One. And then move, of course, when they got to the Premier League, I must be the person who's not interested in that because that's when I moved away and come down to High Wycombe. And there, of course, in this period, you know, the Ainsworth era, they're enjoying, you know, their their best years and they've been up to the championship. And yeah, I thought, well, when we go back up to League One, we'll go to a game. Well, now we're not in the same divisions either. So I'm looking at, Look at even the local team and thinking that we should be higher up than Wickham Wanderers and looking on them with, with some envy. Oh, Yeovil was the worst one. When Yeovil yeah. got to the championship, that hurt. That hurt. It's bad <laughs> yeah. enough being a division below Cheltenham and Forest Green, you know. It's, and this is where we get snobby and elitist. But frankly, you know, when I was a kid, Swansea and Cardiff were nothing clubs, you know. <laughs> now yeah. now we, have, we, we look with envious eyes. But League One, that's where we should be. Well, that's it, Joe. If you move to Swindon, then that's we'll know we'll know that's when the the ascent up the divisions begins. Come on, Joe. Yeah, we should just move back. <laughs> that's <happen>. fine. <laughs> in that, going back to the that's football documentary for a second. In the playoff game, director Peter Archer just before the Tramia semi final, he says to the camera, "This match could impact the next twenty years." Now, I think we know what he meant, and <laughs> um, it sort of did. But maybe to some extent, it could be argued for the worst because of what it did for the financial um, uh, for, for for the club. I mean. Some have said that not overspending, not getting to the Premier League might have led to a more stable three decades for Swindon since. Would you agree with that? Was that something or or was it worth it again just to kind of have those memories that we talked about and talking about a club that maybe has uh, has been in the third tier for, for a lot of their history, having that season in the top tier? You know, if we didn't get to the Premier League, we would have done something stupid. So we might as well got to the Premier League and done something stupid financially because I know that's not the way you should look at it, but we we would have done something daft and plummeted had we gone to the Premier League or not. Uh, We'd have gone all in and bought those ageing players for a championship season um, after Glenn Hoddle. So, So I think it was worth it. I think Swindon Town's Premier League stay was in that awkward transition where we're still in the old world, really. Um, the people that are running the club aren't really football people. They're football fans, 
but they're not thinking of the bigger picture. They're not thinking of the future. They're thinking of right there, right now. So I think the way Swindon's model was, if we didn't go up, I, I think what he's really referring to is if we don't go up now, Glenn Hoddle's gone, Gorman's gone, Digby's gone, Calderwood's gone, Taylor's gone. They're all gone and we're rebuilding again. And I think that's probably fair. Um, and that would that could have been catastrophic had we not got to the Premier League. So um, I, I, I can see where he's going. And I just think it was worth the dice roll. Um, like I said, we would have we would have been in a perilous situation given our, our past, regardless of what we got to the Premier League or not. Do you agree with that, Joe, in terms of fate? Fate would have found a way to have thwarted Swindon if it had, had it not happened. Well, we've had enough false dawn since that, yes, it would have been inevitable that somebody would have would have a thing. I mean, you look at the balance sheet of teams that are in the championship now, and we look at like our neighbours, as Richard said, you look at you know, Bristol City and Reading and some of their arrears. When I was up in Leicester, and you know, they, before the King Power guys had got in there, the state of their finances is... It's not necessarily that, you know, the Premier League, you'll get your big injection of cash. And then if you manage it wisely, you'll be OK. People can even spend you know, into a black hole just trying to keep your head above water in the championship. So I think debt is quite an unavoidable thing. And, you know, being sustainable might suit your man at Accrington or things like that. But Swindon is always, like I said, Swindon's got that potential. It's always going to attract the, you know, the wily investor. And it seems inevitable that we would have we would have gone. The way that, the way that Swindon has been run over the last 30 years, Premier League or not, we would have we would have landed into trouble. <laughs> it's, it's a borderline miracle we're still in in business. To be fair, in some in some parts of our history. Before we put a Swindon Town Premier League squad into the archives, let's just take a look at the all time top scorers and appearance makers of that era. So Swindon's all time top flight scorer is re- then record signing Jan Agafiotov with twelve yeah. goals, uh, left back Paul Bowden with seven, and Andy Much with six. Oh, <laughs> the appearance makers Sean Taylor started all 42 Ooh. games. John Monker started 41. Nicky Summer made 38 appearances. Um, if, incidentally, obviously because he got dropped from the team during that um, barren spell, Fjordshoft only actually started 26 of his 36 games. Uh, so he, he actually got 13 goals in those final 17 appearances in all yeah. competitions, which is obviously even, even more impressive. So, chaps, that is Swindon Town. The overall Premier League record is a sultry season where they played 42, won 5, drew 15 and lost 22. They scored 47 along the way, but did concede exactly 100, giving them a goal difference of minus 53 and a points total of 30. So we're going to put um, an all time match day squad of 16 we've gone for. We did do this beforehand, so I'm going to go through and then if there was any debate or anything like that. Obviously, this is largely the team that made the most appearances and won some of those games, especially in the second half of the season. So we've got Fraser Digby in goal, Nicky Summerby at right back, Paul Bowden at left back, and a centre back partnership of Sean Taylor and Adrian Whitbread. On the right of midfield is John Moncur. On the left is Martin Ling with Luke Nyholt and Kevin Horlock in the middle. And then Jan Argafjortoft and Andy Much up front. We've got Mickey Hazard, Terry Fenwick, Ross McLaren, Craig Maskell and Keith Scott on the subs bench. So how does that kind of, when I mention those names, I mean, apart is, is there, does nostalgia come flooding back with those with those players? Do you have both have real happy memories of seeing those, those boys pull on a Swindon shirt? The overwhelming majority of that 11 will be in most people from that era's all-time 11, um, which is probably all you need to know on that respect. It's it's, it's kind of, it is our best 11. Um, they didn't play that much because of injuries. So Terry Fennick plays a lot of football in replacement for some of the others. And Luke Nyholt came in and out. Luke Nyholt was great. Great blow-dry haircut. You don't see that anymore. Like a blow-dry, spiky hairdo. Um but that, I mean, if we keep that 11 in 94, 95, we go up again. We go up, but that team's fit. And maybe you take much out and bring Peter Fawn, who signs the following season nearer to the end. That, that team's going back up um, if it stays fit, I think. It, it was brilliant. Fraser Digby, one of the best goalkeepers outside the Premier League of his era. And if he would have, if he left us, I mean, we're talking on the 30th anniversary of him joining Manchester United on loan from Swindon because for some stupid reason Glenn Hoddle thought no nah, that's not that's not fair Nicky Hammond's a nice guy but he 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 got ahead of Fraser for a bit so Fraser instead of just sitting around goes on loan and trains with Manchester United to look after Paul uh, Peter Schmeichel for a little bit Sean Taylor 
probably not a top flight um, level player, but just sensational. Nicky Summerby and not John Monker were Premier League footballers. AD Whitbread um, only had the one season with us and then we got rid of him as part of the deal that brought Joey Beecham to us. If he stays in, in the following season, we're fine defensively. Um, Paul Bowden's an all-time great. Kevin Horlock just got better and better and better. Jan Agafiotov would have kept us up the following season had we not sold him on deadline day and Martin Ling was brilliant too. It's just the bench. It's just our bench is grim viewing. Um, <laughs> considering two of them left... Um, they, they, there is. I looked at it. There's no one else we could really put in. Um, but two of them left halfway through the season. Uh, Ross McLaren was injured a lot and at the end of his career. And um, Keith Scott started off so well, but again, was he, he played the previous season in the Vauxhall Conference and then came to Swindon in the Premier League and and was okay. He's a good guy, Keith Scott, but it was probably a bit much for him. So it's a great eleven, Joe, isn't it? Yeah. Keith Scott still gets my my brother-in-law. He uh, is a big Keith Scott fan. I get a picture whenever he's uh, spotted in Sainsbury's doing his shopping because he lives <laughs> close to us. It's surprising looking back because my 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 first game in the flesh, of course, having you know followed along these results for two years, yeah, you know, seeing some of these same names of seeing you know Fraser Digby, Sean Taylor, Paul Bowden, Luke Nyholt, Kevin Horlock, you know, in the flesh, and just to think that you know we talk about you know the modern era and how different things are it just would be unheard of that these players would follow you all the way back down to league one with the idea of pushing back up but you know a real appreciation for me of um you know where they've been and what they came from and perhaps the one thing that soured that that promotion season which was one of the first big highs that i saw you know in person was that i don't think that maybe mcmahon appreciated the the tenure of those people so they were loyal club men who who stayed who stayed with Swindon. And- pre, it was pre Bosman as well, so we probably had more more sway at that stage to keep them. But yeah, they they they're it's a hell of an eleven for us. While we've got you lads, we've got a couple of regular features that we do on the show that I just want to run by you. So. First off, what we try and do is add a Premier League player to the. Premier League of Nations Hall of Fame and we're doing them alphabetically. Today is the turn of Algeria. Now, there have been 18 Algerians on the books of Premier League size during the last 30 years. There is one standout, admittedly, but you may be able to make a case for one of the other shortlisted players. I'll give you the four that we will put out and we'll put this out on Twitter for people to vote for their favourite Algerian player of all time. Here is the shortlist. So we start off with Ali Benabia, Manchester City's cultured midfielder, signed from Paris Saint-Germain and scored in three times and assist in six in the 2002-2003 season. His final game in a City shirt was against Barcelona in a friendly to mark the opening of the Etihad Stadium. Saeed Benrahma, the skillful West Ham United attacker who'd scored nine goals in 62 appearances by the start of the 22-23 season. He's probably added a few more to that total by the time this goes out as well. Islam Slamani, the striker Leicester City brought in ahead of their maiden Champions League campaign. He only scored eight goals in 40 appearances for the Foxes before a goalless loan spell at Newcastle, but he is Algeria's all-time top scorer and second most cap player with a more impressive 41 goals in 88 caps. Or or is it, I try and say uh, as, as neutrally as I can, Riyad Mahrez, the four-time Premier League winner who joined Leicester City for £450,000 in January 2014 when they were still in the Championship and became a Premier League winner just two years later. He came seventh in the Ballon d'Or in 2016 and then became the most expensive African player in the world with a £60 million move to Manchester City, where he's added a further three league winners' medals to his mantelpiece, scoring 77 times in 258 Premier League appearances before the start of 2020. Two twenty-three. So there are four players there. Let's start with you, Rich. Who do you think is the greatest Algerian to grace the Premier League? There's no Hamid Bouatza who actually played for Swindon. So that's, <laughs> that's, that's, that's the first. That's the first one. And yeah, I can't hear Mehdi Karouche, former Swindon lower league, and maybe Sophie Zaboub was a uh, was French Algerian. So this is a difficult one for me. I we all know who should win it, but I'm going Benabia because he was part of that Monaco side in the mid nineties that used to annoy teams like Manchester United in the champions league. Um, I remember him having that sort of six month or year spell where he seemed like a world beater, but he was an aging, <laughs> an aging footballer in the top flight. So my vote is firmly with Ali Benabia. What about you, Joe? 
It's a no-brainer. Come on, I'm going to go for the obvious one. It's got Cinema, to be Riyad Mahrez because <laughs> because uh, this is this is one that I'll remember from. Uh, you know, I used to go to Leicester on the regular. I follow. I'm not. I'm not I'm very much drawing a line. I'm not one of these people who has, you know, several more clubs than a golfer. Do you have a Leicester I, shirt, Joe? I, do, I own a shirt. Owning a shirt is not the same as not the same as saying mm. I am a fan. <laughs> yeah, Mares is someone I remember coming through, and just in terms of legacy, what he's gone gone on to do is is quite remarkable. So you'd have to be the uh, have to be the nod for me. Okay, well, we've got two uh, cases there for a, a Premier League all-time great and a Manchester City cult hero. What we're now going to do is we're going to play our game. We're going to go head to head with our with our oh. game. Play your apps right. So, if yeah. you've never heard this game before, we're going to start you off with a familiar former Premier League player and the number of appearances they've made in the Premier League. I'll then give you another player. You need to tell me if that second player has made more or fewer appearances in a higher or lower format. This is Premier League appearances since 1992, so it does not include top flight appearances before that. And whoever's got control of the board after 11 players will be <laughs> our winner. The prize, guys, is precisely nothing. So oh, we're mm. playing for fun. rights. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So we're going to start off for control of the board. I'm going to give you both a player. You're going to tell me how many appearances. And whoever gets closest will be able to choose if they go first or second. So the first player, the Premier League appearances I'm looking for, is the Premier League appearances of Jan Fjortoft. What are your guesses, Rich? Ooh. So it's Swindon, it's Middlesbrough, it's Sheffield United and Barnsley, none of them of which do too well. So I'm going to go 155. Okay. Joe? I've got a strange mental image that it's not as, I don't know why, I'm, yeah, I'm contacting the runes. I'm not sure it's in the full century, so I'm going to go for 93. Well, Joe, firstly, well done for playing sportingly there and not just going for one lower. It is actually 84 appearances. Wow. Ago. You have Championship con- player. You have control wow. of the board, Joe. Would you like to go first or second? Bear in mind, if you go first, you could romp to the win. If Rich goes first, who knows? It does get more difficult as we get towards the end. I'll go first. I'll be brave. Okay, so we've started with Jan Argafjortoft with 84 appearances. Our next player is Jan Molby. Is Jan Molby higher or lower than Fjortoft? He's got to be higher. He's actually lower. It's yeah, because it's first time. division. Come on, he's a... Come on, Joe. Appearances for Liverpool. Check so me there. Back... Got me there. Yeah. <laughs> so we're back over to you, uh, Rich. Another Jan, Jan Vertonghen. So higher than... Uh, Jan Molby at 35 oh appearances. Oh, God, higher. So, yeah, Jan Vertonghen, <laughs> 232 appearances for Spurs. So we stay with you, Rich. Patrick Vieira, higher or lower than 232 of Vertonghen? Got to be higher. Again, it is higher. 307 for Arsenal and a short spell at Manchester City. What about another Patrick? Patrick Berger, is he higher or lower than Vieira with 307? Co, I've had a lovely day. I'm saying lower. <laughs> <laughs> you are correct. It's 229 appearances spread across 12 consecutive seasons for Liverpool, Portsmouth and Aston Villa. What about his Czech compatriot, Vladimir Smitser? What was uh, Berger before? 229. Uh, Smitser was injured a lot, so I'm going to say lower. You are correct. It's actually 121 appearances in six seasons for Liverpool. We move from Smeetzer and 121 appearances to Mark Crossley. Mark Crossley blended into the from the first division to the Premier, Nottingham Forest, Middlesbrough, Fulham, higher. It is higher, 204 appearances. Fantastic knowledge there as well. The Forest, Middlesbrough and Fulham, yeah, as a Welsh international. <laughs> you are four from the end, Rich. You're on a roll. So we've had Mark Crossley with 204 appearances. Sorry. Our next player is Dennis Wise. Oh, it's got to be higher. Dennis Wise is higher. 278 appearances for Chelsea and Leicester. After Dennis Wise, it's Colin Hendry. Dennis Ooh. Wise had 278. Where does Colin Hendry so Colin rank? Hendry yeah. has his Blackburn phase, but I don't see... And then he got injured, so I'm saying lower. 
his lower 218 yeah. appearances for Blackburn, Coventry and Bolton, two to go. Colin Hendry, how about another Scottish Colin? Colin Calderwood. Is Colin oh, Calderwood. I'm not going to lose it on Colin Calderwood. <laughs> uh, no. Is um, Colin Calderwood higher or lower than Colin Hendry's 218? 218. 18, Jesus, that doesn't help. Um, so... So he's late into it. It goes to Spurs. Then he has Villa. Um, I don't think he can match that. So I'm saying lower. You are correct. Oh, it is 189 God. appearances. If, Joe, you're going to have to sit this out and watch because it all rests I'm on I'm enjoying. Rich I'm enjoying. <laughs> with a sudden <laughs> death penalty. So Colin Calderwood, 189 appearances. Obviously, we know about his Swindon links. To win it, Rich... Another man, famously with Swindon links, Paolo Di Canio. Colin Calderwood has 189 Premier League appearances. Will Joe snatch it at the end or will you take it? Is Paolo Di Canio higher or lower? Paolo Di Canio would be the death of me. Um, <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm happier that Colin didn't, didn't down me, but I fear that Paolo might. So West Ham, Sheffield Wednesday... Charlton lower. Rich, Paolo Di Canio is higher by 190 <laughs> appearances and 66 <laughs> goals. You name the clubs as well. Incredible knowledge, but unfortunately, Paolo Di Canio has thwarted you at the end. Joe, I mean, what a how how was that? If, Does if that mean I win? Is that you, double or nothing? Do I get the lot for doing you, none of the work? That's great. <laughs> I love it. Perfect. <laughs> it was it was the perfect uh, perfect performance there, Joe. Uh, lads, thank you so much both for coming on. Uh, we've already mentioned the low strangers. Where can people find that? I imagine Swindon Town fans already know. Do we just oh, search I that? I hope so. Um, yeah, we're everywhere. So I think we're in all the major platforms. Um, and yeah, we we do two a week at the moment, um, mostly based on the current season, but we also have a back catalogue full of ex-players, including Jan Fjortoft, inc including Colin Calderwood, not including Paolo Di Canio. So, um, yeah. Dream guest, right? A dream mm, guest. He isn't anymore, I tell you. So. <laughs> and Joe, where can we find you? And uh, where can we find you? Where can we find you on stage in the, in the months ahead? Well, I haven't been on for, for such a long time, Carl. I've just been standing in for um, for Rich on things like that. But I am at Joe Ross Williams on Twitter. People can follow along and whatever I've got planned, that it'll be announced on there. Fantastic. Thank you both very much for joining me. Really appreciate it. Rich, a wry shake of the head there. I think Paolo Di Canio is going to haunt you for the rest of the day. He already Thank does. <laughs> Thanks for joining me, lads. So that was Swindon with Rich and Joe. I hope you enjoyed that chat. I really did. Uh, lovely guys. And I love that common theme that every football fan has, that their team is chaotic, that their team is just out to get them and make their lives both miserable and joyous. That really came across from both Joe and Rich. So thank you for listening to the show today. Uh, next week's show is my chat with Brian Dean, former England international Brian Dean. We chat about his time playing for England. We chat about his time playing abroad. We discuss playing under Graham Souness and Steve McLaren. He has, let's put it this way, very differing responses to those two managers and this is a podcast about the Premier League so of course we do discuss that famous iconic goal against Manchester United the first ever of the Premier League era it gives some great insight into into that moment if you've enjoyed the show today please leave us a review wherever you get your podcasts we've had some lovely ones this one is from Bill GB another football podcast yes but a really good one Absolutely. Take a trip down memory lane of football with this podcast. Thank you, Bill G B. Big shout out to whoever left an anonymous one-star review. I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, I, I hope you find Jesus. 
And don't forget to pass the pod as well. Not necessarily the one star person. You're probably not going to do that. Uh, pass the pod. Uh, find Help me find people who will enjoy this, hopefully, as much as you're enjoying it. I've got some great episodes coming up in the weeks ahead as well. So uh, pass the pod. Let someone else know about us. But until next week, that is all from me. Thank you so much for listening. And see you again next week for that chat with Brian Dean. Thanks for listening to When Football Began Again. Join us again next time for another slice of Premier League nostalgia. In the meantime, subscribe, leave us a five-star review, find us on socials, and spread the word with all your Premier League-loving mates.